um, the title of this presentation, I think, is kind of a provocative one. It's what if this turns out to be a terrible time to retire? And I've been thinking a lot about retirement de decumulation really for the past decade plus as I helped my parents figure out their own retirement plans and helped my in-laws figure out their retirement plan. As, and as I've been thinking more about my own retirement plan, um, there's a lot of material there. I often think about all the time I spent talking about, you know, how to accumulate assets for retirement. And the, the fact is, unless you do something really crazy with your asset allocation and have a poor savings rate, you'll probably be okay with respect to your accumulation plan. But decumulation just gets a lot more complicated. And from my standpoint, as someone who writes about this stuff and speaks about this stuff, there's just a lot more material. There's a lot more to talk about and people really need the help. So that's the focus of today's presentation. We'll talk about why the timing of your retirement matters so much. And unfortunately for most of us, it's just kind of luck of the draw. We might have the opportunity to delay retirement or continue working in a part-time capacity, but in many respects and oftentimes the timing of our retirement is out of our hands. So I'm going to um, share my screen here and share my presentation with all of you. Hang on one second. going to switch into slideshow mode. Okay. Everyone can see my screen now, I hope. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So just a quick Morningstar overview, not a Morningstar commercial. We provide financial information, research for a variety of audiences, individual investors like yourselves, financial advisors, institutions. We've got uh, data and research in a lot of different areas. Many of you kind of think of us as the mutual fund people. And indeed that's what Morningstar was when I joined in 1993. But we've since broadened out to offer research in a lot of different areas. In fact, I think the goal for us is to enable people to look at their financial plans holistically, including as many components of the, the financial plan as, as they have. So we have research on individual stocks. Increasingly, we have a lot of research on index funds and exchange traded funds, because that's very much where the energy and the financial services industry is these days, which is a credit to Jack Bogle. We offer individual fixed income research, so research on individual bonds, private securities with our acquisition of PitchBook. We now have um, research on the, the private markets. We have a big emphasis on sustainable and ESG investing. I know some of you are interested in that area. Some of you may not be, but our goal is to provide people who are interested in ESG in their portfolios with good research on what the best uh, products are for, for doing that. And the little group that I work in as part of Morningstar is focused on portfolio construction and planning. So we focus on retirement planning. We focus on how to put together portfolios. We focus on asset allocation. So um, my group is composed of Jeff Patak, who is our, who is my co-host for the podcast that I work on. Amy Arnott, who focuses a great deal on um, uh, portfolio construction and John Reckenthaler, who is even more senior than me at Morningstar. He's been writing for Morningstar.com for many years. And I think is many of our favorite, uh, many people's favorite uh, columnists at Morningstar. <laughs> He's absolutely a, a, kind of a must read for me every, every week. So um, that's just how Morningstar is set up. In terms of what I'll cover in the presentation, I'll start by talking about why the timing of your retirement is so impactful. And as you think about the timing of uh, Christine, somehow you got muted. So. Okay, looks like everyone got muted, including me, but now I just unmuted okay. myself. Um, so I'll start by talking about the timing of your retirement, why it's so important. I'll talk about what should be on your dashboard as you're kind of thinking about retirement readiness, equity valuations, bond yields, and inflation, inflation kind of the elephant in the room today. 
Talk about the implications then for retirement portfolios in terms of withdrawal rates, in terms of the asset allocation and the intra asset allocation of your portfolio, also inflation protection at the portfolio level and at the plan level. I'll also talk about implications for non-portfolio decisions that you might make for your retirement plan. So social security filing, the timing of social security and annuities, which are a topic I think of renewed interest, arguably a bit vulnerable in an inflationary environment, especially the fixed kind of very vanilla annuities that people like me tend to like, but we'll touch on annuities and how they might fit or not fit within a retirement plan. Let's see. Um, this is a slide that my former colleague, David Blanchett put together and I just love it. This, um, on the left-hand side of the screen, depicts a person with a 50-50 portfolio, so 50% stock, 50% bond, retiring in the early 70s with a $500,000 portfolio, taking a 5% withdrawal rate. And if they just went along decumulating in that fashion with that 5% starting withdrawal and then giving themselves little inflation adjustments on that dollar amount thereafter, you can see that within 20 years, such an individual with such a plan would have been out of funds because that period that he or she retired into, as we reflect back on market history, would have been one of the worst environments to retire into because you had a big bear market in 73, 74. You had rising interest rates that hurt bond prices. You had rising inflation in the 1980s. So every bad thing that can conspire against retirees did, in fact, in that particular era. That's why when Bill Bangin did his research on safe withdrawal rates uh, back in the 90s, he focused on that specific period. Because when we look over modern market history, we know that, that this is the worst period that one could have retired into in modern market history. So that's what would have happened in that historical period if someone had taken that 5% withdrawal rate too high, right? because within 20 years, he or she would have been out of funds. We like to think about retirement portfolios lasting 25 or 30 years to support longevity. So that was that time period, early 70s through early 90s. The right-hand side of the screen shows a hypothetical sequence of returns, basically flipping the sequence on the left on its head. So the really great returns that investors had in the second half of the 1980s and in the 19, early 1990s actually occurred in the early part of the period. So same 50-50 portfolio, 50% 50 stock, 50% bond, same 5% withdrawal rate. You can see that not only would this person who was using that decumulation strategy because this was a more forgiving market and in fact a good market environment because the strong market returns occurred early on in retirement and the bad stuff occurred at the tail end. Not only was this person able to meet his or her income goals, so take that 5% initial withdrawal and then inflation adjusted thereafter, but also the person was able to uh, add to his or her portfolio. So the portfolio actually grew over the time horizon. So this illustrates to me, I think really nicely how much of this is just very dependent on the time, time period and the specific confluence of events that prevails during the time period of our retirement. And unfortunately, we don't have a heck of a lot of control over when we retire. So um, sequencing risk is something that researchers talk a lot about. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this idea, but the sequence with which returns occur, with which inflation occurs in your retirement time horizon matters a lot. So ideally you would be buying stuff low, you'd be buying stocks cheaply, you'd actually be doing your accumulation in a declining market, and then you'd be selling into a rising market. That's the ideal sequence of returns. It's kind of counterintuitive. This idea of accumulating during depressed valuations probably doesn't feel great at the time, but uh, the good news is that, is that that does help support higher withdrawals later on. 
A bad sequence of returns is when you are accumulating assets at elevated valuations, and then you're having to sell them off into a declining market environment. That's a negative sequence of returns. And it's often important for retirement planning because that's often when our portfolios are at their largest, at the beginning of our retirements. So if the beginning of our retirement happens to coincide with a declining market environment and we're taking too much out of our portfolios during the time during that time it leaves less in place to repair itself and recover when the market eventually does that's why so many people in the retirement space are so focused on this sequence risk and helping retirees manage sequence risk I mentioned that um, our retirement dates aren't 100% within our controls, in, within our control, and people tend to be not great judges of when they might retire. So this was some uh, research done by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that looked at people's anticipated retirement dates relative to their actual retirement dates. And what we see when we look at this data is that generally speaking, people tend to think that they'll work longer than they're actually able to work. In fact, I often encounter people when I'm out and about speaking who say, yeah, my plan is just to keep working as long as I possibly can, that that's really my financial plan that I need to keep working until I'm 80 or, or whatever. Well, what we see when we look at the data is that oftentimes the reality of people's situation does not support those later retirement dates. So for example, um, 42% of pre-retirees said that they expected to retire in that 65 to 69 year period, when in fact, just 16% of retirees actually did retire in that age range. Many more people retired in that 60 to 64 age range than anticipated they would do so. So just kind of food for thought that even though your goal might be to continue working, you may not be able to continue to work for whatever reason. I often uh, quote my colleague at Morningstar, Mark Miller, who's a contributor to Morningstar.com and writes a lot about various aspects of retirement planning. He always says working longer is a worthy aspiration, but it's not a financial plan. And we all know the things that can derail someone's desire to continue working. So it might be health of our own health, health of a spouse, health, health of a parent. Many people getting close to retirement still have parents who they are looking out for. Um, we know that people do jobs that entail physical exertion that may not be able to be tenable as they go forward. Um, we know that people, that ageism is a thing in our culture and in our workplaces. So people may have a goal of continuing to work, but uh, may be dislodged from their workforce for whatever reason. I will say that the tight labor market is, um, I hope, easing that issue a little bit, but nonetheless, it's something I think worth keeping in mind, especially as we get closer to retirement and as, and as we get uh, toward the end of our working careers. So the risks of early retirement or retiring early to, earlier than you expected to are manifold. Um, so all of the great things that we say go along with working longer work in reverse if you're forced to uh, retire earlier than you expected. So no opportunity to make additional portfolio contributions, fewer years for that money to compound prior to drawdown, withdrawals over a longer time period. Uh, would necessitate a lower starting withdrawal amount. So if you are withdrawing over, say, a 35-year period versus sort of the 25 to 30-year period that a lot of the retirement research has been done on, that necessitates that you be more conservative with that starting withdrawal rate. And then um, it may reduce your ability to benefit from the delayed Social Security filing, which can oftentimes be one of the most impactful things that people can do in terms of helping improve their longevity protection for their financial plan. If you can enlarge that social security payout through delayed fi filing, that can be really impactful because obviously that's a lifetime stream of income. So the decisions that you make there are very important. But people who retire early sometimes are forced 
to take Social Security to help make ends meet. So um, just some things to consider in the realm of early retirement and how it can be a negative with respect to a financial plan. So as you think about your retirement plan and its um, insulation against the current market environment, I would urge you to keep a few key things on your dashboard. So we'll talk about equity valuations. The good news story of the declining market environment that we've had so far this year is that equity valuations are down and that portends better return potential from stocks going forward. Um, bond yields have also gone up. In fact, that's been the main thing that's been bugging the stock market and the bond market so far this year. And the good news story there is that higher bond yields, even though they depress prices, at least in the short term, do uh, help influence higher uh, bond returns going forward because yield is the biggest component of your return as a bond investor. And then inflation, I would say that's maybe a, a little less of a positive story, um, but we'll talk about thinking, I'll, I'll talk about thinking about inflation with respect to your plan and the timing of that inflation. So let's start uh, by looking at equity valuations. This is uh, Schiller PE developed by Robert Schiller, professor at Yale, Nobel, Nobel laureate. Um, and you can call up this Schiller PE on a daily basis. As you may know, Schiller PE has been flashing a warning <laughs> signal for a while. Um, and uh, it, the Schiller PE is a cyclically adjusted PE ratio. It's meant to reflect market valuations. You can see that it has looked elevated for a while now. It's come down a bit thanks to the equity market value volatility that we've had so far this year. So I just grabbed this screenshot yesterday. Um, we're not back to the levels we were at in the early 2000s. That's when Schiller PE was at its highest in sort of that pre-dot-com bust period. But you can see that um, Earlier this year, late in 2021, we actually got a little closer to that early 2000s period. So um, equity valuations have come down a little bit, but based on Schiller PE at least, are a little bit elevated relative to market history. I like to look at our um, Morningstar fair value uh, levels as another sort of check on equity valuations. This tells a little bit of a more of a positive tale. And I'll just describe what we're looking at. I mentioned that we have a lot of stocks under coverage, so individual stocks under coverage. And when we ask our analysts to cover individual stocks, the basic job is come up with what you think this company should be worth based on discounted cash flow analysis. So our analysts crunch their numbers and come up with what a company should be worth. Um, and then we can come up with a price to fair value relative to, so, so the current price relative to that estimate of what the analyst thinks it should be worth. So to give a simple example, if a company is uh, trading at $100, but the analyst thinks it should be worth 80, then the price to fair value would be 0.8 for that company. If the company were trading at $120 and the analyst thinks it's worth 100 bucks, then the price to fair value would be 1.2. So one thing that we can do is that we can roll up all of these price to fair values to try to get our arms around, well, does the market look cheap or expensive right now? Not that you'd necessarily want to upend your portfolio plan based on this information, but I think it's kind of a data point that you can refer to. And this is part of our Morningstar Investor site, which is our um, kind of our premium site. You can check out the, um, I think this is probably might be part of a free part of that site, but you can check out the price to fair values on an ongoing basis. What you can see is when you look at this today, the typical company, the, sort of the aggregated price to fair value values are signaling undervaluation, so roughly 20% level of undervaluation as of yesterday. And then you can see looking back in time, there have been various points in time where stocks actually got really expensive. So 2021, for example, our analysts thought that the market was pretty picked over. And so the typical company in their coverage universe was trading at a, at a uh, premium to fair value. But right now, this would signal that um, 
it stocks look relatively cheap, which is not to say that we've bottomed. We may see more volatility from here, but if you are in accumulation mode or using a dollar cost average, averaging sort of system to add to your holdings on an ongoing basis, I think this would be a signal, at least to me, to just keep doing that because you're probably scooping up stocks at, at relatively depressed valuations. Um, this is a look at how the pain in the market this year has not been equally distributed. And many of you know this, especially if you have discrete holdings in your portfolio of individual funds that might focus on a specific segment of the equity market. You can see that the deep red stuff, the really bad performance, has been very concentrated in the growth realm of the style box. And I'll just describe what we're looking at here. This is meant to depict the equity universe on the basis of market capitalization, so company size and the horizontal bands, as well as investment styles from value to core to growth. So value would be energy companies, financial companies, core would be some of the consumer staples companies, healthcare, especially the pharmaceuticals would tend to land in that core area. And growth would be a lot of the high flying stocks. So they'd be the technology stocks, for example. They'd be some of the biotechnology companies that have had really great results until recently. So many of you know this firsthand from your portfolios, but this slide is just meant to depict what we're seeing in terms of how various squares of the style box have not participated equally in this sell-off. It's largely been concentrated in, in the growth stocks. And if we were to look back on our analysts' price to fair values in 2021, we would have seen that they were saying, yeah, this growth part of the style box looks pretty expensive to us. Value looks relatively less expensive. Um, but anyway, just kind of another data point to keep on your radar as you're thinking about, well, is the market cheaper or expensive? We've seen growth stocks fall hard to the point that when we look at price to fair values, and I apologize, I don't have a shot of that, but when we look at where the discounts to fair value are, they're pretty evenly distributed across the style box today. That while our analysts do tend to like the value stocks and do find it find more, do tend to find more cheap names there, they're actually finding some things to like in the growth column as well these days. Um, this is a slide that is uh, courtesy of some of my colleagues in Morningstar Investment Management, and they do these forward-looking capital markets forecasts. Many firms do them, BlackRock, Vanguard uh, will periodically put out these forecasts. And I think some of you might reflexively be kind of dismissive of how can anyone do forecasts? Aren't forecasts ridiculous? And my thought is that short-term forecasts, like what the market might do over the next year or three years, yeah, probably ridiculous, not worth engaging in. But in terms of your financial plan, you need to plug something in, right? How much, how much help am I going to be able to get from the market in my years, my accumulation years, or in my decumulation years in retirement? So I think you need to use something. And the key is to use either market history, which may be an unreliable guide, or to use something that's a little bit more forward looking. So our team puts together these capital markets forecasts. I actually have an article publishing on Monday that's kind of a compendium of different firms forecasts. And I would urge people to do that, to not just rely on a single provider's viewpoint, which may be influenced by its own biases in whatever way, to, to look at a few different ones. Um, but to come up with these forward-looking forecasts, our team for the equities um, looks at starting dividend yields, looks at our expectation of earnings growth, and looks at expectations of price earnings multiples expansion or contraction over the next decade. So these are 10-year forecasts. The return estimates that you see here are annualized. Um, on the bond side, what we know is that starting yields are a really good predictor of what bond investors are apt to earn over the next decade. So that's the main input for bonds and cash in this case. These are nominal figures, so they are not inflation adjusted. 
But one interesting takeaway as I look at this, and this has been persistent uh, for our Morningstar investment management team, as well as for external firms that look at these capital markets forecasts. One thing you can see is the expected returns for non-US stocks are much higher than is the case for US. So what we're looking at, at are two sets of bars for each of asset class. So the kind of aqua bar is the expected 10 year return for these various asset classes. And then the green bar is the change in uh, the asset class forecast just in the first quarter of 2022. I looked at um, some figures through mid-year 2022, and what we've seen is actually these numbers have bumped up a little bit since March of 2022. So we see a slightly more encouraging picture for U.S. stocks because U.S. valuations have continued to fall. That gives us a little bit more confidence that we'll see some PE expansion in, in the U.S. market. But non-U.S. stocks look like uh, look li likely to offer better returns, especially emerging markets equities, of course, with higher volatility in emerging markets than, than U.S. stocks, certainly in probably developed markets, foreign stocks. So that's, um, I think, one thing to think about if you haven't rebalanced your portfolio. It's been difficult to love foreign stock holdings and has been difficult to keep the faith in them. But if you haven't done any repositioning and want to maintain X percentage of equity exposure. Also take a look at that non-US exposure because uh, foreign stocks look relatively inexpensive. Bond yields I'll touch on in a sec. You can see that they have come up a bit in keeping with um, rising interest rates and the Fed's activity. And that in turn uh, bumps up our bond return expectations. Just a quick look, this is a uh, some of the information that I gathered in the article that I mentioned is coming out on Monday, but you can see that this enthusiasm for non-US stocks does cut across providers. I looked at um, what Vanguard had to offer and they hadn't yet updated their information since the end of uh, 2021. So they may be just on a once annual uh, capital markets forecast. But you can see that when we look across firms, we see that same level of enthusiasm for non-US stocks relative to US. So perhaps something to keep in mind if you haven't done any repositioning there recently. Prospects for fixed income are more settled. I mentioned that starting yield tends to be very closely correlated with subsequent returns. When we go back to this slide, we can see that yes, in fact, uh, bond yields and bond return expectations have come up, but they're still not great, which I think is an argument for not staking too much of your portfolio and in safe investment, safe, um, quote unquote, especially in an inflationary environment. But it argues for not, certainly not holding more cash than you need, not holding more bonds than you need. Um, because of the low absolute returns and the vulnerability in the face of inflation, which is not to say you don't want to hold bonds and cash, especially in a retirement portfolio, but it's just that you don't want to go overboard, especially with the headwind of higher inflation. Um, you can see that this uh, finding, this expectation that bond returns will be pretty low is, a, it's, is consistent across providers. There's more unanimity on this topic than there uh, is in most areas of finance and investing. People know that uh, bond yields tend to be very closely correlated with subsequent bond returns. So you can see high quality fixed income investments. Most providers are not expecting them to be any great shakes, but return prospects have improved a little bit as yields have come up. Um, just wanted to highlight the yield differential between lower quality bonds and higher quality bonds, which is what you see on this screen. You can see that um, they were about as low as they could go in 2021, but they've actually bumped up a little bit quite recently. And that syncs up with um, some of the concern that the Fed could overdo it in terms of rising interest rates, could be too aggressive and inadvertently or perhaps advertently bump us into some sort of a recessionary environment. And that's why we've seen some widening of the spreads between higher quality bonds and lower quality bonds in an environment where people are thinking, well, the economy could soften, 
they would say, well, for a higher, for a lower quality bond, you need to pay me more to hold that lower quality bond. I need a higher yield to protect myself in that, that environment. So we've seen um, that yield differential widen out a little bit, but it's still pretty narrow uh, relative to historic norms. In fact, I sometimes reference mentally, I remember early in my, earlier in my career when I was a fund analyst for Morningstar, I would cover some bond funds. And I remember the rule of thumb for high yield was that you wanted to be a buyer when spreads were roughly eight percentage points. So you'd want to be a buyer. If, if prevailing high quality yields were 4%, you'd, you'd want to be a buyer when high yield spreads were 12%. Well, those days are long gone, given that, that yields as a group are so compressed. So just another um, data point. I know many of you probably don't bother with high yield bonds, and I, I can't disagree with that um, assessment. But for those of you who do have room in your portfolios for lower quality bonds, just some um, food for thought as you, as you think about uh, those positions. You can see that um, most firms do accord higher return prospects to high yield bonds. Um, back on this earlier slide, we looked at how the Morningstar team had the highest return forecast for high yield bonds, certainly relative to US aggregate bonds, um, treasury bonds and high quality corporates. And other firms concur with that general assessment that the lower quality bonds will likely have higher returns than higher quality bonds, but of course, um, significant volatility to accompany those uh, sorts of investments. In fact, I often say if invest, investors want to include those bond types in their portfolios that they should think of them as kind of like light equity exposure rather than fixed income exposure. Because when push comes to, push comes to shove and in, we're, we're in a bear market and, or some sort of a recessionary environment, we tend to see high yield bonds behave in sympathy with stocks. They tend to be more stock-like in those environments than bond-like. So anyway, just some food for thought on that front. Um, I want to touch a little bit on inflation. You can see that inflation is uh, largely a global phenomenon. It's not limited to the U.S. I'm sure that you've all been paying keen attention to inflation. It's been pretty hard to ignore as we go about our daily lives, um, especially the fact that inflation has been hitting us in just the core categories that are not discretionary. So food, certainly energy costs, gas costs for our cars, rents, uh, home prices have, have all been elevating. So it's been pretty difficult to ignore. It's been difficult to control. Um, one point I've been making on the inflation front, and this, this is something that I kind of stole from Jason Zweig when he wrote a great column about this topic about probably 10 years ago. But Jason's comment slash point was that inflation is really kind of personal based on how we spend our money. And so food inflation is impossible to avoid. We've all got to eat. But if we're not driving a lot, we've probably been relatively less affected by gas prices. If we are driving a lot, if we have long commutes for our jobs, we've been relatively more affected by higher gas prices. Um, so I would urge you all to kind of think through your personal com consumption baskets, think about how you spend your funds and use that to come up with kind of a, a customized look at your, your own inflation exposure. If you're a homeowner, the good news is that you're relatively insulated from some of the inflation that we've been seeing in housing costs. If you're not a home owner, you've likely been more impacted. So um, that topic of meflation, I call it, is an important one. I think it, it can help you figure out how freaked out to be about the current inflationary environment. Um, this is just a quick look at how home prices have elevated right along with other types of prices over the past, uh, over, um, let's see, what period are we looking at? One year. Um, you can see that it's been pretty geography dependent, but many markets have seen high, really high uh, price increases in terms of, of real estate prices. And that in turn has had a ripple effect for renters um, where rents, uh, where rental properties are able to push through rent increases. 
So um, inflation has been pretty hard to ignore. I want to talk a little bit about inflation and retirement. Um, and there's some debate about how worried to make people about inflation and retirement. I used to kind of have this debate with my former colleague, David Blanchett, about this. His point was that many retirees, when we look at the total retired population, receive a very large share of their income needs from Social Security. And Social Security, as we know, does deliver at least a decent inflation adjustment to help keep retirees whole with CPI from the, the percentage of their income that they're taking from Social Security. Um, the fact is, though, many retirees are drawing upon their portfolios in addition to Social Security, in addition to pensions, which may or may not be inflation adjust, adjusted. And simultaneously, retirees also have more of those portfolios typically staked in safer investments that are vulnerable to inflation. So if I have cash in my portfolio, if I have bonds in my portfolio, my yields kind of are what they are, and inflation is going to erode the purchasing power from any interest rate that I'm able to earn on those investments. So the portion of your portfolio that you're pulling from, from to fund your income needs is going to be vulnerable to inflation, which I think is an important sort of finding as you think about your retirement portfolio. You want to think about how to protect that portfolio against inflation. So um, this has been kind of a data dump so far. I, I apologize, but I will say we're going to get into kind of the practical, what do we do about all this sort of takeaways from uh, what we've just looked at here. So the implications uh, for people getting close to or entering retirement, I'll talk about withdrawal rates, how you should think about withdrawal rates if you're someone who's just embarking on retirement or maybe expects to retire in the next couple of years. I'll talk about asset allocation, a little bit about intra-asset allocation, inflation protection, and non-portfolio income sources. So withdrawal rates, um, I'm happy to say my colleagues and I worked on some research, some of you may have seen it, it came out in November of 2021, where we looked at sustainable withdrawal rates, because this is such an important component of people's retirement plans, figuring out how much they can safely withdraw per year, figuring out how to manage those withdrawals on an ongoing basis, so whether to be flexible in terms of withdrawals, we found that it was just a really rich vein to dig into, to look at different aspects of withdrawal rates. Um, so this is a backward looking view of what would have been a sustainable withdrawal rate for various asset allocations over various periods in market history. So we assumed 30 year time horizons. And what you can see is kind of what we looked at on that earlier slide where I said it's just kind of luck of the draw. Um, the specific market environment that prevails during your retirement time horizon is going to determine how much you can take out. So you can see that the 100% um, stock mix supported the highest possible withdrawal amount. But the problem is, and the reason I wouldn't recommend anyone come into retirement with 100% stock mix, is the problem is that you could encounter a really bad market environment early in your retirement. And that would relegate you to a fairly low starting withdrawal. So you can see that these um, sustainable withdrawal rates, what would have been sustainable over a 30 year time horizon really were quite period dependent. Um, and you can see that uh, the balanced portfolios um, at the low end would tend to, would accommodate a 3.7% starting withdrawal and a 6% uh, starting withdrawal at the high end. Just want to describe how we went about um, factoring in the withdrawal system that was used to underpin um, this, this research, we assume that someone was using kind of a fixed real withdrawal method. So if my starting withdrawal, if I have a million dollar portfolio and my starting withdrawal is 3.2%, I'm taking out 32,000 initially. So I'm taking out 3.2% of my million dollar balance. And then I'm just inflation adjusting that 
uh, 32,000 thereafter. So if inflation you know, is say 3%, I'm taking uh, maybe 33,000 in year two of retirement. I'm using a fixed real dollar amount on an ongoing basis. That's what I'm taking out of my portfolio. That was the general strategy in place in Bill Bengen's seminal research where he looked at safe withdrawal rates. He assumed that retirees wanted sort of that fixed real standard of living in retirement. So that was kind of the base case that we used to uh, examine sustainable withdrawal rates historically. So uh, history is a guide, but we attempted to look forward encompassing where we are now in terms of stock and bond return expectations. Um, this is just a little bit more on historical sustainable withdrawal rates. Um, and this looks at uh, 30 year withdrawals. Um, so we're assuming 30 year rolling withdrawals over a variety of asset allocations. So 75% stock, 25% bonds in the dark green bar, 50% uh, stock, 50% bonds kind of in the middle and the sort of the medium blue bar. And then bright green would be the low stock exposure, 25% stock, 75% bonds. You can see that over most market environments that the highest withdrawals were supported by the higher equity allocation. So the 75% stock, 25% percent bond portfolio tended to support the highest starting withdrawals. But back in the sort of 60s, 70s period, it didn't matter what you had in your portfolio, any mix of assets, even the conservative one, because of that high inflation environment, because of rising interest rates, because of a bear market in the early 70s, didn't matter what you had in your portfolio. The 4% withdrawal or thereabouts would have been the most that would have been sustainable for retirees in that very bad period. So if you look back on Bill Bengen's research, you see that he focused in that specific period. He wanted to look at what would have been the worst, if someone had had the bad luck of retiring into the worst market environment. Outside? Outside. If someone retired into the worst market environment in, in history, what amount would have been sustainable? His conclusion was that roughly 4% was the most that you could have taken out if you happened to encounter a really bad market environment. So um, our research in, attempted to incorporate a more forward-looking view, incorporating our teams, our Morningstar investment management teams outlook for stocks and bonds. So this was um, data, their return expectations at the end of 2020 that factored into our research last year. We'll be updating that research in 2022, incorporating their revised forward-looking forecasts. But when we looked at that uh, sustainable withdrawal rate that would be supported by a roughly balanced portfolio in um, a 30-year period, we concluded that a withdrawal rate, a starting withdrawal rate in the roughly mid 3% range would be the most that would have been supported. Now, my expectation is when we revise this research and incorporate higher return expectations for new retirees, I think we'll have a somewhat more sanguine um, picture. And in fact, I don't want to front run our research, but I would be surprised if we didn't conclude that a 4% withdrawal rate for new retirees would be sustainable. So um, I don't want to scare anyone with this because it is kind of backward looking. It's based on the market's valuation prior to the recent volatility, prior to the recent stock losses, and prior to the recent increases in bond yields. My expectation is that for people embarking on retirement today, that uh, likely a higher withdrawal rate would be sustainable. Um, also don't want to scare people who are already retired, because the good news is if you've been retired for 10 years or 15 years, you kind of have avoided the thing that retirement researchers worry about. You've avoided that bad sequence of return. You've actually had halfway decent returns during your retirement so far. And so if you're further along into your retirement, even if bad returns occur, say in the second half of your retirement, that's going to be less impactful in, in terms of you and in terms of your plan and its sustainability. 
um, this is more food for thought for people who are kind of thinking about retirement in the future. So um, some best practices to come away with as we think about withdrawal rates in this environment where stock returns are better, but maybe not 10%. Um, and bond returns are better, but still not fantastic. I think that there are a couple of best practices to think about. And one is if you think about being flexible with your withdrawals, that can just be incredibly impactful um, in terms of helping you take more out of your portfolio. So in our research, we examined a lot of different or at least several different variable strategies for withdrawals. But the general takeaway is that if you can annually kind of update your portfolio withdrawal rate assumptions, that that'll allow you to potentially take more in good market environments. And the trade-off is in a market environment like 2022, you actually, if you can, which is tough with inflation, if you can take a little bit less, that can be incredibly impactful. If you are wedded to taking a fixed real withdrawal from your portfolio, so if you're using kind of that Bengen method, that uh, 4% where you're taking, uh, say, 40000 out of a million dollar portfolio and then inflation adjusting that $40,000 amount, you would arguably want to be a little bit more conservative you, if, if you weren't planning to, to vary your withdrawals at all. Um, one thing we looked at in our research was whether just really simple uh, tweaks to uh, sort of baseline fixed real withdrawal system could help lift starting withdrawals. And what we found is that, it, yes, indeed, they can. So we looked at some research um, initially done by T. Rowe Price coming out of the great financial crisis, where they looked at simply foregoing the inflation adjustment in the year following a portfolio loss. Their research pointed to that simple adjustment being incredibly impactful. I think the key though is in a high inflationary environment, it's um, essentially telling people to take a pretty big haircut in terms of their withdrawals. If we're saying forego inflation adjustments in a year like 2022, that's uh, a little more to deal with than would have been the case over the past couple decades where we had pretty benign inflation that I think we all perhaps got a little bit complacent about during that period. So these are some best practices as you think about withdrawal rates. Um, there's certainly been a lot of great research in this space. I'm proud of the research that we did, but also Wade Fow, who I know is a friend of the Bogleheads, um, Jonathan Guyton, who is, I think, a terrific financial planner and a great researcher, David Blanchett, uh, have all contributed greatly to this body of research on withdrawal rates. Um, in retirement asset allocation, so switching over from withdrawal rates, how do we think about asset allocation? You can see that retirees are balancing competing issues. So they need the higher returns that typically come along with equities. If your holding period is 10 years or more, you usually have higher returns than you're able to earn with other asset classes. So they need that growth, especially in an inflationary environment, but they also need safety in their portfolios to help them manage that sequence risk. Because I mentioned one of the big issues with sequence risk is if you're taking too much from a portfolio that's simultaneously dwindling, you can impair that portfolio's ability to recover. So the idea and sort of the main thesis behind making your portfolio a little bit more conservative as you get close to retirement is that you're kind of battening down the hatches with a portion of that portfolio and you could spend from it and leave the more volatile portions of the portfolio in place to repair and recover. And that's one reason why um, many of you know I'm kind of an evangelist for this bucket strategy of retirement portfolio construction. Um, I think it's just a good way to kind of think about, well, how do I build a runway of safe assets that I could spend from so that I wouldn't have to touch anything that's depreciated? Unfortunately, in a year like 2022, we have stocks that have fallen and we also have bonds that have fallen, which is not a typical pattern, but one that we're seeing this year because rising interest rates have hurt both stock and bond prices. So that's the logic behind having at least a couple of years worth of anticipated port 
portfolio withdrawals in cash investments. That's your buffer to help protect you against uh, an extended downdraft in bond prices and especially stock prices. And the idea and the intuition behind, between buckets one and two together is that it could give you a runway of assets that if Armageddon occurred with your equity portfolio, where we have stocks that fall and stay down for a long period of time, you effectively have a runway of assets that you could spend through if you needed to in that environment. Yes, bond prices are down currently, but the idea is that you might have some short-term high quality bonds that are maybe down say 3% this year. Um, intermediate term bonds have declined more meaningfully, but the idea is that you would, if you had spent through your cash assets that you could then move on to short-term bonds. So this is just an illustration, um, kind of a model portfolio. And I have several of these model portfolios on Morningstar.com. They're meant, not meant to be anything anyone could invest in and we're not making any money on these. They're just kind of there as a way to illustrate, well, what, what does a sane in retirement portfolio look like? And the idea here is that we're assuming retirees um, with a, taking $60,000 out of their portfolio a year, they have a million and a half dollar portfolio. So they're taking a 4% withdrawal from that portfolio. Um, they're spending $60,000 a year. So that would translate into bucket two, that cash bucket being composed of two years worth of those portfolio withdrawals. So that's just kind of the liquidity bucket, we're not taking any risks with that portion of the portfolio. It is vulnerable to inflation, but we're not taking any um, interest rate risk or any other risk with that portion of the portfolio. But from there into bucket two, we are taking a little bit of risk because we need to earn a little bit of return. We can't just sit there and be vulnerable to inflation. So bucket two includes a combination of fixed income assets. So I've included some high quality short-term bonds. I've include, included some short-term inflation protected securities. You could include I-bonds either in this portion of the portfolio or, or in bucket one. Um, or it, arguably it, it could go in bucket one as well. Um, but you're holding a little bit of inflation protection in your fixed income exposure. And then you have some high quality intermediate term exposure as well, which should be able to deliver a slightly higher return, assuming you have a time horizon of say um, between five and 10 years for intermediate term bonds. And then bucket three is just a globally diversified equity portfolio mainly. If you owned junkier fixed income investments. If you, for whatever reason, have something in your heart for precious metals or commodities, you might hold them in this bucket three. But most, for the most part, this is a globally diversified equity portfolio. You could also three fund this portfolio if you wanted. So many of you know Taylor Larimore, the great um, influencer in our Bogleheads community. He has written a book about the three fund ultra minimalist portfolio. In this case, you could just have um, uh, your cash, your fixed income, your total, total bond market, and your total international and, and total US market in bucket three. Um, I do like the short-term bonds, though, as a component of this bucket system, because I think that a year like 2022, where we've seen fixed income assets, especially intermediate term fixed income assets get crunched, the idea is that uh, if you have short-term bonds and you've depleted your cash investments, you could draw upon the short-term bonds in that instance. Um, I mentioned the idea of not overdoing bucket one, even though it's attractive, the idea of having cash assets, especially in a year like this one, there is a big opportunity cost. And Wade Fow, I mentioned he is um, one of the leading lights in retirement research. In fact, I have his book on my desk because it's such a good one. Um, it's called Retirement Planning Guidebook. But he has um, written about how you could use other buffer assets as a component of your portfolio. Um, his in his toolkit would be a standby reverse mortgage, potentially life insurance cash value to the extent that you have any sort of permanent insurance policy. It likely has some cash value built up that you could that you could tap rather than holding dedicated 
cash investments and then annuities might also be a fit in this context. Um, alternatively, another idea to help reduce the opportunity cost of holding cash on an ongoing basis would be to simply not fully replenish buckets one and two as, as you deplete them. So if you're in an environment like 2022 and you're having to spend from bucket one and then maybe that moves on to bucket two, the idea that is that you would reduce the opportunity cost of those safe assets somewhat if you didn't fully replenish them and just ran with a more equity heavy portfolio uh, for the rest of your retirement. Whether that works behaviorally, I think is an open question, whether retirees would be comfy saying, well, I've just been through a terrible equity market and yet I'm going to continue to hold a very large equity portfolio. I think that's an open question. Um, and then one other point I often make on this front is that we have sort of 10 years of the portfolio in buckets one and bucket two, 10 years worth of portfolio withdrawals. In a way that's kind of a luxury good, that it's a fairly conservative portfolio. Retirees with tighter plans might think about having a little more in bucket three. It's gonna give the portfolio more volatility, will probably provide less peace of mind than the portfolio that has more staked and safe assets, but it will also grow a little bit better than the portfolio with more in buckets one and two. Um, let's see, inflation protection. I wanna talk a little bit about how to in address inflation protection as part of your portfolio and as part of your plan. So at the portfolio level, you've probably all read plenty of stuff about how to make sure your portfolio is insulated against inflation. I think treasury inflation protected securities and I bonds are probably the best tools for the job. I often recommend uh, Vanguard's short term inflation protected securities fund. Um, you can either buy the index fund, the traditional mutual fund or the ETF. But I like it because it is tips protection with a, a, out a lot of the interest rate related noise. Because one thing we've seen, you know, as we look at um, like the VIPSX, the intermediate term tips fund that Vanguard offers, what we see is um, a lot of sensitivity to interest rates. And oftentimes we know that interest rates are changing, interest rates are going up at the very time when we need our inflation protection. So I like the short-term tips fund because it offers more or less pure inflation protection without all of that uh, interest rate related noise. I bonds, of course, are another tool that should be in all of our toolkits. Um, purchase limits might sort of constrain or do constrain how much we can all buy, but um, nonetheless, uh, they're a good and pure inflation hedge. When we think about the asset class with the best opportunity to outrun inflation over the long haul, stocks I think are a good example or are the best example. Um, I always take pains to point out stocks aren't any sort of direct inflation hedge and 2022 is a perfect example of that because inflation up, stocks way down. So it's not sort of that one-to-one -one performance um, that we would expect a true hedge to deliver. But stocks, when we look at their long run results, they do tend to out earn inflation. At the plan level, um, a couple of ways to think about inflation protection. One would be delaying social security. So in addition to that enhanced benefit that you pick up, you also receive the inflation adjustment that you would have received along the way. Um, and then also I think factoring in inflation into your portfolio spending plan is also important. So if you're worried about inflation, um, and you're thinking about, well, what should my withdrawal rate be? What's a safe withdrawal rate? Being conservative with that starting withdrawal can help encompass or help you adjust to higher inflation adjustments that you might need to make down the line. Um, in terms of uh, non-portfolio income sources and the implications of the, the current environment, 
the lower yields, lower bond yields, especially make delayed social security filing even smarter. So you can pick up an increase in your social security benefit for every year that you delay past your full retirement age. I would urge you all to hop on Mike Piper's great uh, and free tool called Open Social Security that helps you model out different anticipated filing dates. Um, and you can actually factor in your separate earnings histories. If you're part of a married couple, you can factor in health histories. So if you think that you'll be a person who has a really long life span for whatever reason, you can actually make adjustments there. So it's a really neat tool that can help you arrive at the optimal claiming date. Um, and that's especially important with, for married couples who have different ages and different earnings histories. I would crunch the numbers and get some help there. Um, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about annuities. I think there's a lot to like about annuities. And I know many of you bogleheads might say, oh my gosh, I think annuities ought to be marked with a skull and crossbones. But the fact is um, there are really basic low cost annuities. So not the high commission junkie products that we often hear about, but rather just very vanilla annuities where you give an insurer uh, maybe a percentage of your portfolio, a portion of your portfolio, and then they just send it back to you as a stream of income throughout your life. Um, the issue is that annuity payouts are similarly like bonds affected by the interest rate climate. So when interest rates are really, really low, insurers can't offer, the much, it can't offer too much in the way of interest rate payments. They can't offer too much in terms of payouts because they know, well, if we don't want to risk people's money, if we want to be able to make good on the promises that we're offering here, we can't sink the money into stocks, for example, we need to put it into a pretty conservative portfolio. So annuity payouts have been pretty depressed. They've been picking up a little bit recently, but they're still a bit low. The bigger issue with fixed annuity annuities, especially kind of the good kind of annuities that do tend to be pretty low cost, is that it, it's impossible to buy an annuity that offers uh, an adjustment to help you keep pace with CPI. So you can buy annuities that do offer some inflation adjustment. So you might be able to lock in like a 3% or 2% inflation adjustment in perpetuity. There aren't currently any fixed annuities on offer that are linked to CPI. So you're not protected in a year like 2022, where 2 or 3% is nothing compared to the actual inflation that we've all been experiencing. So that's, I think, a kind of a headwind against annuities. The virtues though, and one of the re reasons that the academic research tends to really point to the value of annuities is that you get this longevity risk pooling. So you're able to earn an elevated payout relative to what you could uh, earn by buying a portfolio of cash and bonds, of trying to like roll your own annuity. You're better off being in a pool of other annuitants, some of whom will die earlier, some of whom you hope it'll be you will live a really long time. And that bumps up everyone's payout because they know that, you know, there will be some unlucky people in the pool who buy an annuity at 68 and have some terrible diagnosis at 69 and are not able to get their money out. That plumps up the payment for everyone in the pool. Um, as a side note, I think another key benefit of an annuity is just that paycheck equivalent, that idea of the money just keeps coming in. You, you know, we know, I know from my own family that cognitive decline is an issue among older adults. That idea of having a percentage of cash flow needs in addition to what, what they're getting from Social Security, to have a percentage of that just come in through uh, the annuity payout, I think can be very, very powerful. So um, something to consider, we've been writing more about annuities. We've been trying to shed some light on this space um, in our upcoming research, looking at withdrawal rates. We plan to spend a little bit more time looking at various annuity types, looking at the potential to reduce portfolio demands, reduce withdrawal rates. Um, potentially you can even use, if you have an annuity payout coming in that 
reduces your need to have safe investment assets in your portfolio because you're, you have kind of that safe stream of income that's coming from the annuity. Um, I mentioned that I'm biased toward the very vanilla annuity types. So the single premium and the immediate annuities, deferred income annuities might be another idea. They're sometimes called DIAs. You can buy um, such an annuity through uh, an IRA, and that's called a qualified longevity annuity contract. Definitely get some help. If you're venturing into the annuity space, get some help from someone who is fee only, is not compensated on any commission, someone who's able to take an objective look at this for you, rather than um, you know going to an insurance company and saying, hey, can you tell me about annuities? I would, I would work with a, a fee only, ideally an hourly advisor to help you figure out whether such a product could be a fit for you. So I'm just gonna end it there. I know I've been um, talking for a long time here, just a little bit of information about how to find me. Um, you can email me, although I will say I can't take anyone's personal portfolio questions. I don't um, offer financial advice. Uh, what you see is what you get through my work on Morningstar.com. I'm on Twitter. I, I actually have a lot of fun on Twitter and um, LinkedIn. And then the podcast uh, that Greg was nice enough to mention that I co-host with Jeff Patak is called The Long View. We've uh, got a lot of great guests coming up and I have a terrific archive of people we've interviewed in the past as well.